Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Independent Living Management presents Pioneers in Disability Rights and Community Organizing, an interview with Mike Oxford. Hi, I'm June Tails here with Doug Uziak, and we're interviewing Mike Oxford about community organizing issues. Mike, can you tell us how you got started in community organizing? Sure. Um, actually, I got started um, long ago in high school um, in the Latin American Solidarity Movement. Um, and um, we, you know, we did some local actions in Manhattan, Kansas. I was, oh, in high school. Uh, and um, it was a really big deal um, around, uh, mainly around Nicaragua where uh, the Sandinistas had come into power and the United States was mining their harbors and things. And um, I remember that um, Secretary of State Schultz came to Manhattan and it was a big lecture at the university there. And we went to the lecture and we snuck these banners under our shirts, you know, and we unfurled them in the middle of the thing, U.S. out of Nicaragua, U.S. out of Central America stuff. And then we got thrown out of the lecture and we were still kind of trying to chant and do some things, and the Secret Service were not thrilled and eventually kind of ran us off. But that's, that was really probably the big thing that I got started in. So how would you transfer that into the disability movement? Well, it seemed to me to be the same thing. It was about um, having a government that was open and responsive and fair and that obeyed its own laws. And um, oppression is oppression, whether it's based on where you live in a different country you know, or the color of your skin, um, and things like mistreatment and poverty and poor health um, are pretty universal issues that people worldwide um, need to fight against. And those are certainly issues in the disability community that have been um, targets of advocacy forever. Could you talk about what you see as some of the key values and principles of community organizing? Sure. I, I think one of the main things that I would say is I think there's a difference between organizing and leadership. An organizer wants to build up power, knowledge, and activity in a given local community, and it could be local very small, your neighborhood, or local very large, even national. But an organizer wants to teach and wants to develop leadership um, for that local community as a, and, and build local leaders and build leaders as opposed to being the leader. And so I see a, a key thing as an organizer wants to transfer power um, to another leader um, and let that develop that way. Um, and so that's a key value is we're trying to teach and empower other people and that's what a good organizer does. Um, the second thing is knowing the environment that you're in, the milieu. You have to do things that people buy into in that local community, um, not just what the organizer thinks is the way to go or the organizer thinks is the biggest or key issue, but what that local community is willing to buy into and what that community thinks are the issues. So it's the, uh, the local buy-in uh, there. And I think the, f the third major thing is setting targets and goals. You have to be clear. We see many people that are upset um, and then you hear things, for, I've heard it this week, Nickel ought to do something. We ought to do something about this. Somebody ought to take this up. And you have to focus in. Who is the somebody? What is the thing? And, and develop that. And setting the goals and the targets are, are very important. And, and a final thing related to setting your goals is you need to be realistic. Oftentimes, issues and problems are so large and so huge that you just don't know where to start and you can't buy into it. And so the example would be um, health care is a big problem and we ought to have health care and someone ought to do something. And it's so huge. Example, look at President Clinton's health care bill. It was a thousand pages long and so complex and it was hard for people to buy into. And so it's, it's developing steps along the way that are doable, that make sense to the local community and that you can get a victory and see progress step by step. Um, and that way you can break it down and you have a sense of purpose and victory as opposed to a huge problem that seems insurmountable. You, you talked about the community, um, or what the community will accept or 
or, or, or deal with. How does that transfer to the various type of street theater or techniques that you employ in community organizing? Well, it very much um, um, transfers and, and, and is associated. For example, some of us, let's say, and adapt a group that I'm involved with um, that's uh, somewhat known in the disability community. Uh, we use civil disobedience um, within a range. Um, we would block traffic, um, do things that maybe get arrested, you have to go to jail, and things like that. But that may not be comfortable within a local community. Um, and even though I think it may be a good idea, if folks aren't going to buy into it, I'm going to have an army of one by myself, and that's not powerful. So maybe for getting started in a community, the thing to do is a letter writing campaign, and people are comfortable with that, and then they can learn. Or, um, again, theater. People are comfortable with a march. Um, I remember when Nickel didn't used to do marches, for example, and now it's sort of if we don't do one, something's wrong and it's remiss. But it was kind of a big deal at first because people didn't know how they felt about it. And you know, maybe sometime later, you never know, maybe Nickel will decide a march is not enough and then they'll maybe do something else um, along the way. So again, that's the buy-in piece. And the main thing that, that you do is you want to get attention for your issue and you want to make progress on your goal. And so it depends on your target and what the issue is. Um, for example, you know, with some legislative work, you have to be careful um, um, employing certain tactics because if you really want a legislator to buy in and that's your goal, then you need to be careful not to totally alienate them and drive them off. Um, so you may do something a little bit different, perhaps a little uh, more respectful or a little more fun. Um, for example, uh, one time, we were when Senator Dole was the key senator in Kansas, we did a campaign where we sent cookies. And we sent one cookie one day and two cookies the next day. And we sent folks, you know, folks with disabilities dressed up like Santa Claus. It was the holiday season with a box of cookies and a copy of the first Mikasa. And then we sent two people dressed like Santa Claus and two cookies and two copies of Mikasa. And we did this until we had like a huge box full because we wanted them on board and we didn't want to totally, totally alienate that. On the other hand, if we wanted to really make a point and we really wanted to make a break, then you would up the ante and in fact alienate them if that is what the goal is and get them angry too to try to jar something loose. So it really depends on what your strategy is and what your end goal is. Sometimes the end goal really is is just to make a statement and get, get your opponent angry and then drive them to show their anger or to maybe say something that if they weren't angry, they wouldn't ever say, but then it comes out that they are in politic or they do have a certain bias or something. And then, but you, then you're not really trying to get them to support your issue. You're trying to get them to show their bad side or something. You okay. talked about issues uh, like the big issue of health care. Mm -hmm. um, how do you break that down into focusful issues? It's one part. Second part, you started to talk about types of involvement, like marches, civil disobedience. What other kinds of involvement can people take part in in this big okay. picture? I, I guess, guess the, the first part, um, um, I'm sorry, help me out here. It was health. Oh, health. For example, health is really big. So one of the things that we're looking at now and that has been is, well, maybe we can reform the homebound rule in Medicaid. It's one very small piece, but yet it's very significant and would be a very significant reform, but it's doable and folks in the disability community really understand that concept. Another example might be prescription drug coverage as one very small but important piece of health care that we could win and move ahead for a lot of people. Other types of activities is I'm a strong believer that the only wrong kind of activity is to do nothing. Almost anything will work. and and there are different comfort levels, phone calls, letter writing. I always tell folks, in a given situation, driving the van may be a key thing um, to, so people can get from A to B. Making posters. Some people are very creative and articulate, and in fact, their handwriting is legible, mm -hmm. so they can do posters. And without posters or signs for people that are driving by or something to see, you know, you're missing an important piece. Um, folks, we, we're talking in the disability community, um, attendance and personal assistance is very important. 
So these are the kinds of things that you need to actually get up and get out and participate. Um, and, and so almost anything will work that's important. And as you put together a campaign, large or small, it's all those pieces that everyone can do something. And it's a matter of making sure that everything is important. Uh, I, I think the attendance, the folks who make signs, the letter writers are just as important as the person doing the media interviews and, and things that seem to be more prominent because without those pieces, it's a much less effective action and, and people can fit in um, and be comfortable. And I found that then folks will grow and then want to try out new and different things. You'll find folks that are very nervous at starting out and they just want to make signs or maybe help drive the van and the next thing you know, you find a burgeoning media star who will do the interviews and it's very rewarding. When you've got that big picture item, even if it's localized in a community, but it's multifaceted and all these various avenues or nuances to that, how do you focus on that as an advocacy issue in order to break it down so that it becomes a, either a defeatable or a creatable situation? Um, well, to me, um, you need to do that, and that would be, in terms of a process, that would be getting your group together and discussing things um, with your group and going through a variety of, of ideas, large and small, maybe good and bad, wild or conservative, and so on, and getting the breakdown and making sure everyone's clear on the target, on the strategy to hit that target, and then buy into it. And so there's no real right or wrong there, but that's something that I would take to my group and uh, really discuss and um, break down until folks were comfortable and everyone agreed that we could get it done. Because no person has all the knowledge. I'm certainly capable of having wild big things, and then you talk with your group, with your peers, and then they help you kind of also structure things and, and make sure that it makes sense. And by the time within any given group, folks discuss it and boil it down, it usually really will work because a lot of good minds have, have looked into that. Can you talk about your role models, your mentors in terms of community organizing? Who did you learn from? How did you learn from them? How did you use them? Sure. Um, probably the biggest role model would be Wade Blank. Learned a lot from him. I certainly remember the first ADAPT action I went to. And uh, Wade hands me this radio and says, OK, if anything happens, call on the radio. And the police came. And I'd never done this before. And they were threatening arrest. And I was like, Wade, Wade, here's the police. They have these rubber gloves on. And they're saying they're going to arrest us. And he came around the corner. But learned a lot um, from him in terms of being tough and aggressive, going outside of what would be expected, but also tempered with being fun and friendly and diplomatic. And that's what Wade was really good at. He's really well known, I think, for the ag aggressive kind of adapt style. But folks who knew him personally knew that he was really um, a fun-loving person and uh, very diplomatic and very personable uh, and easy to get along with. Um, another person um, is uh, you know, Bob Kafka really helped refine that by working with him over the years. And, and doing different things and being involved in, in different kinds of leadership uh, are two uh, real, real important folks uh, in terms of, of what I've learned. What are the various community organizing activities that you're particularly proud about doing or being involved with? Um, let's see. Well, um, in a smaller way, it's certainly being involved with um, the incipient Americans with Disabilities Act and that excitement and being up here in the Capitol uh, and um, seeing that happen and being involved in the process from um, when um, um, Towards Independence came out from the National Council on Disability, then called National Council on the Handicapped, I think, came out on that outline and um, a lot of work and emotion started happening and reading all the drafts and, and commenting on different pieces of the legislation and commenting on the regulations and all that piece. I remember being up here in the Capitol, and I don't even know where, 
it was in one of the office buildings, and we were in this room, I think, that Bobby Silverstein got us, and there was Pat Wright and Liz Savage in there just, like, barking out orders to run around and do this and go there, and you better fill out the sheet, and you didn't put your contact notes right, and you better go back and write this down and that kind of thing, and it was very organized, very tough leaders getting a, a good job done. Uh, very, very, very important. I think another thing that um, probably is big that I'm real proud of is being involved with drafting the Mikasa legislation in various forms and getting that introduced. It's very interesting and fun and working with different members of the disability community and the kind of compromise, um, careful use of language, looking up all these other laws and regulations and trying to fit everything together that a wide community could, could agree to and not just nickel and not just adapt. Uh, very good. And um, probably a third thing that I'm really proud of was a time um, when we had organized within ADAPT and we'd done demonstrations and letter writing and done a number of things. And I got to meet with um, President Clinton in the White House in the, uh, um, oh, in the room where all this cabinet, the cabinet room. Um, there, and uh, that was real interesting and, of course, exciting and everything, um, you know, being in there and in my overalls and whatnot, and there's the president, and I remember when I turned around, they have these bronze plaques on the back of the chairs there where the different cabinet officials had sat, and, and someone told me that, in fact, there's a pecking order. The president sits in the middle and then to one side are the different cabinets, and it was the uh, Secretary of War, now Defense, is right next as the, one of the oldest and most important and went around. And I think I sat in like the CIA director's chair or something. It was really kind of eerie going, well, this is weird, you know. But that was kind of cool with those um, plaques behind the chair. And so those are big things. Um, some smaller things maybe um, is we developed, I helped write and develop and get past some state legislation that gave people in the state of Kansas a legal right to direct their own attendant services, including nursing activities, without inter any interference. And that was a really big, rewarding win to do that, because it was in a time before the ADA and before I think there was a big, a lot of big attention and interest in this. And it was a very, very proud thing to actually be involved with writing that and getting it passed so that folks in our state have an absolute legal right to do that as opposed to an opinion of a doctor or a social worker or something. Have you ever found yourself in the middle of a situation that needed community action on a local front? Of course. Uh, many, many, many times. Um, one time was, again, early on, right when the Americans with Disabilities Act passed, we didn't have any accessible buses in our community. We didn't have, we had one paratransit van. It was a subscription service with a waiting list so long that you literally had to wait till someone moved out of town or died to get on it. And then you can only get rides to work or to the doctor, and that was all. And we organized and really worked hard on getting that done, including, in the end, working with our local transit authority to write a grant um, to get some new accessible buses. and having every vehicle that is in the public service completely accessible to people with disabilities and having a paratransit system that really works and um, very proud of that. That's, that's an example. Another thing is at one point we uncovered, people are out and around now, and the sidewalks were in such poor shape at home that it was really dangerous and you couldn't roll, it was hard with a cane, it, it was hard regardless. And we also found out that there was a big interest with senior citizens. And one of the quirks we found in our community is that in our town, the sidewalks in front of your house, even though they're in the public right of way, are actually the responsibility of the homeowner. And where the oldest sidewalks, and in fact the worst shape, were in the oldest neighborhoods with a lot of senior citizens and a lot of poor people who did not have any money to fix their sidewalk. And we weren't going to have people getting fined and getting in trouble over sidewalks. That's not what we wanted. So we worked with neighborhood associations and some senior groups on that. 
and rounded up some grant money to help pay for getting the sidewalks fixed. And we all worked together and strategically we targeted those sidewalks that were on accessible paths to transit along with our transit issue so that in fact folks could get down the sidewalk and get to the bus stop without having to go broke or get in trouble and then use the new accessible public transit and not rely on paratransit because you couldn't get up and down the sidewalk. So those are just a couple of examples. What have you learned about getting people involved, keeping people involved, and helping people kind of transform their own anger into focused energy? Well, if you're going to be a good organizer, and in a different context, a good leader, you have to lead from the front, not from the back. And I think a lot of folks, sophisticated or not, are very aware that um, if you're behind pushing, going, go ahead and stick your neck out, go ahead and take a risk, and you can do it, but if you're not taking a risk yourself, if you're not out in front yourself, then they see that as not being realistic or in fact kind of being a little bit hypocritical. And so one thing is any risk or activity that you're asking someone to undertake, you have to be very visible and very much seen as out front and doing that yourself and pulling people as opposed to pushing. And I think that's a real key, is that it's easy to, with, uh, to sit in an office of an agency with your budget and go, okay, all of you consumers, get out there and do that. Independent living is about risk. But then, well, I can't do this because it's a funding source. Or I can't do that because I have a relationship with this state official or that legislator or so on. And people really see that, and then folks won't respond. And um, and I just think that's probably a real key thing. And again, it's the buy-in. You just can't have unreasonable expectations. And so you, sometimes you have to go slow and really you know, be with people in very small steps until, until people get comfortable. And th I think there's another trick. There's no recipe. It's just the folks that you know. And so you have to know who's in your group and be familiar with people in terms of what what folks are comfortable with and what needs to be learned and what maybe just needs to be um, prodded or encouraged in terms of different uh, activities. Um, some folks, the best way to do is you go along with and kind of sit there and even maybe take the lead. Other times, um, it might just really be that the key is to get out of someone's way and just let them go and do their own thing. And that's just a matter of knowing people and knowing uh, who your folks are and being with them. What about the, the anger thing and helping people with, with getting in touch with the anger and then using the anger as an energy mm -hmm. source? Well, I think anger is a great motivator, and I think it exists in a lot of people. And unfortunately, a lot of people, the anger is internalized, and then they almost use it against themselves. And these would be folks that maybe, you know, rely on drugs or alcohol, or maybe even do things that are, that, that are uh, hurt themselves because they're mad and won't bring it out, and, and they see that as appropriate. Because in fact, sometimes folks, I think, learn that it's okay to be hard on yourself, but not to direct that towards the true enemy or the true problem. At the same time, just random lashing out anger won't get anything done. And so it might just really be a matter, again, of focusing in on what is the target of this anger. And, and you hear things, you know, I'm sick and tired of being jerked around by, by vocational rehabilitation or by being poor and unemployed. And, and um, gosh dang it, and so the, the negative part of that would be you're just lashing out at your counselor, you're messing up appointments doing what they would call being non-compliant and then getting in trouble that way as a manifestation uh, of, of your anger. And in fact, that can be very negative because when you're non-compliant too much, then they close your case and then you don't get anywhere. So at the same time, the counselor may be very much an authority figure. They've got a suit and a tie and nice clothes and I don't. They've got a master's degree and I don't. And so I can't really buck them. And, and that's the way that it goes. And, and I don't even know who to go over the head. And so I would say to channel that, it's, like, it's a human being. No one's perfect. 
and you have these rights, and so you have to explain to people what their legal rights are and what those regulations are and how to use them. And um, then you can deal with that counselor who is not doing their job and finding out what the chain of command is, how to do an effective appeal, you know, and how can bump that up in a proper channel, and you can still use language and you can still be angry, but in fact you're productive and, and you go up through the food chain until you get what you want. And so, and that's an effective channel of that anger. Mike, how, how do you actually sit down with a group of individuals when you've identified an issue? I mean, is there some process of a beginning to develop a strategy? What do you got to look at and what do you got to think about when you're, you're, you're going to take on a big community issue? Well, first of all, in terms of who you're sitting down with, I can tell you it's just people that I know. It's my friends, it's my colleagues, and you go with people that you know, um, especially, I think, initially. Because with strangers, then you don't know what their buy-in is, you don't know exactly how they're going to respond, and things like that. So you start with folks that you know each other, and there's a certain relationship and level of trust, not necessarily agreeing all the time, but that you know each other, you know, kind of are familiar with each other's moves and um, you know, how you do things. In terms of developing issues, we literally will sit down with a flip chart or um, you know, overhead or something and just start writing ideas down. And you might write down a whole lot of ideas and, and reject them until you find one that people go, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And so it's almost as simple as that with folks that you know and you brainstorm, and, and, and until it's kind of like, aha, well, there's the buy-in. That's the one that we can do that will work. And oftentimes, it'll start out very angry and very messy, you know, including kind of wild things. Well, let's take Renquist and put him on a rocket to the, you know, and send him to the Skylab kind of thing for fun with a certain pointedness. And then going, well, we can't really do that, so maybe you know, there, we can do something else. And, and so that's literally how it works, is we brainstorm and come up with ideas until you come with the one or two that you buy into. In terms of new people, um, you invite folks, or folks would contact me, and you invite them to the meetings and see how it goes. And some folks will have an interest and they'll respond in different ways, and, and other folks may not have that interest, and that's fine. But again, you start with a core of people that you know real well and go from there. And then you invite others or word gets out or I get calls. I saw this newscast. I, I read this thing in the paper and I want to know more. Do you have a newsletter? Do you have a web address? Something like that. And then you attract people that way who tend to agree already because of the way it's been um, um, published or, or done up in the media. And then they come along and that's how you grow. It's interesting. It's kind of different than uh, some of the Saul Alinsky stories, you know, where they would go house to house to house, knocking on doors, and not always starting with the core people that they even knew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your experiences and what you've learned in terms of coalition building and negotiating. Coalition building. Again, it's identifying an issue. You build coalitions around issues, not personalities and not people and not organizations, but it's the issue. And understanding that coalitions can be long-standing, almost permanent, or they can be short, and that's okay. In other words, building a coalition on a given issue, folks may come in and you know it's going to be very short-lived and all bets are off after this issue. And, and an example is when we were doing some Jack Kevorkian kind of work, including locally, um, what, who came along? All the anti-abortionists and the right to lifer types. But on a given piece, we were agreeing on this little bitty narrow piece. It was kind of uncomfortable, I can tell you, but the agreement, at least there, I remember being up in my office and we were doing some of this, was on this very little narrow slice, okay, all bets are off, we're not doing anything you know, like that. And they agreed, and we agreed that would be it. You know, so that's an example. And, and they can be longer lived, but it's almost um, always uh, around the issue. And I'm sorry, the second part of that question was? Well, negotiating. Uh, negotiating. You mentioned me CASA before. And right. Well, one thing that people need to understand with, with 
negotiations is you always have to leave an out. If you're just going to back someone in the corner, then, like what Machiavelli said, you better kill them. Because it's a dangerous person in a corner with no out. And um, usually you're not really going to kill someone off. And so you have to leave an out for everybody, even if you don't like them, even if it's all unreasonable, because then there's nothing to negotiate. Uh, it's sort of like that uh, movie Independence Day, you know, where the alien is in the thing and the president is going, what do you want? And it's, die. Well, that's not nothing to negotiate. You know, you have to die. Well, that's not a negotiation. That's a war. And so you always leave the out, and that's the key thing. And in terms of negotiation, you have to, again, emphasize those areas that you can move ahead on and probably be willing to accept a compromise. Again, with no compromise ever, it's not a negotiation. It's a whole nother critter. So it's figuring those things that you can move on and you can agree on, however small, and then drop the things that you can't. And that's a matter, again, of, of what your key values and issues are, and what are your hills to die on, and what you can give up. So it's like horse trading. Typically, you start out asking for a lot more than you know that you're going to end up with. To follow up on that whole discussion, when do you back off? When do you decide within yourself as a, an advocate doing the good fight when it's time to move on or just leave the issue alone? Well, in terms of an issue, I guess you never want to leave it alone. You may want to try a different way. You may have to come back. But I guess once you take an issue, you have to stick with it, understanding there's a lot of different paths, an unlimited number um, to get there. In terms of a particular piece, um, the good thing is that um, I don't usually negotiate by myself. And that helps um, keep things on track. And so if you come to a sticky point, that's when you would go back to your group or your team or some others who, who you trust, who can kind of tell you, well, no, you've gone too far, or well, yeah, this is OK for you to give up. And so a key there is, boy, it's a lonely place if you're all by yourself saying, you know, hang them or not, you know, shoot the gun or not. That's a very lonely place that I wouldn't want to be in. You should negotiate honestly and have a team there or a way to go back so you can get some nuance, uh, you can get some help with you know, what the issue is. And that's back to your, to your group or maybe some, some smaller numbers of the group who are the natural leaders or something like that. And then kind of get them, is this something to buy into? Is this OK? And so I would just say is try not to be left representing an entire group all by yourself um, and trying to negotiate that way, because it's really easy to make a mistake it's really easy to run off from your group. And so a key thing I'd tell everybody is make sure you have an ability to check in on your decision making. If you're representing a group, um, probably you need to be checking in with that group somehow. Within ADAPT, we've even done things where we've had radios or cell phones in meetings. And we'll call back and let's say, we're inside Health and Human Services. There's a group outside. We're calling outside. Is this OK? Can we do this? Or we'll ask the folks. We need to stop. We need to go over here and meet with our group and run this by, and we'll be back with you. And we do that all the time with the police, with federal officials, state officials, legislators, and so on. Because if you get off by yourself, it can be pretty difficult and, in fact, be pretty weak. Mike, you've done a lot of walking around the Capitol, talking to elected people. What, what kind of words of wisdom can you pass on about what you've learned? With elected officials, well, first, try to be smart. Try to know what that official's background is, what their key constituents that they view are their key constituents or interests are. And you can find this in various handbooks and so on. In my state, for example, we have this state handbook, and it'll tell you where they live, what groups they associate with, who gives them donations and how much, what their Chamber of Commerce rating is, and things like that. And you can get to know them a little bit. And sometimes it's the personal touch. You might know, or even through a conversation, find out that maybe someone um, also owns a horse, or maybe they're also from an agricultural background, or they like 
fast cars or something, and you can talk about a human factor thing, that then you make contact. And so you have to make contact somewhere, but also to understand elected folks have a lot of constituencies. And so they're continually trying to juggle different groups that frankly may be very divergent. Just up here on the hill, for example, a um, number of people are, are, are pushing um, a home and community-based um, um, equivalent to institutions. But we know right when we're up here doing this, the voice of the retarded, who is a parent group trying to save the large state hospitals, are up on the hill at the same time. And so legislators are hearing two very different things, and we kind of have to understand there are different constituencies, and then you try to figure out how to get around it. In modern times, you talk about conservatism and um, independence and key words in a, in, a, in, a, in a conservative climate, you also talk about not spending money, and which is, in f frankly, cheaper. And so you have to knowing who the different constituencies are that elected officials trying to please all of them. So you have to know a way around what those other arguments are. And so you also have to be very familiar with what else is out there and then how to counter it. And the climate that you're in. Um, you know, talking about a social contract and and things like that in this particular political climate in Washington will get you nowhere. But if you talk about fiscal conservatism and, and states' rights and buzzwords like that, you may get somewhere. Is there a pecking order as far as when you employ civil disobedience? And if there is, what would be the steps of getting there? Um, personally speaking, I think there is. I, I kind of use the theory of escalating conflict. And basically, it means you use the lowest possible level of conflict to get your win. And so if a simple meeting or a letter will, will do it, you don't go and take over the office and do an arrest kind of situation. On the other hand, I am never comfortable with just taking no for an answer. So if you write a polite letter and don't get a response, then you try to get a meeting and don't get a response. Um, or maybe then you maybe you get a commitment, but it's not followed through with, with, and the answer is no, 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 I don't care, go away, no, no, no. Then at some point, that's where civil disobedience comes in at the level where you can't think of any other thing in the system that you can do to push the issue, and you're just stuck with a big no, and that's not acceptable. Then you go outside the system, and that's what civil disobedience is. Can you talk about your um, online organizing experience and what's worked for you and what hasn't? Okay. Well, actually, um, I wouldn't say that I'm a Luddite, but I'm not really good on technology. So I'm not really good at online stuff, but I know it is the wave of the future. And so what I've done, actually, is employ someone who knows a lot about web pages and computers and things like that to help design web pages and to get stuff up. And in fact, it's been really pretty rewarding. Um, an example is we had some media coverage from some state activities that we were doing. And those were able to be emailed from all over the country. And I didn't know it. And it was video and audio. It's really pretty cool. And I have no knowledge of that. And it, frankly, it's still a little bit scary to me. But those got out. And I got calls from people all over, oh, I saw that coverage and it was really cool and we could hear you chanting and things like that and so that made me feel really good because they actually because of technology felt like they were there they could see the pictures they could hear the noise they could hear who was speaking and so on and it was really pretty cool so I guess at this point my theory is you find someone who knows about technology is uncomfortable with it and then make sure that it happens that way like that was actually on your website I mean, mm -hmm. they, they integrated that into your into your Somehow, program. yes. What do you do locally in order to cover some of your activities in order to keep the issue rolling? Well, we do have, um, we do employ web pages. We have a pretty good newsletter, Old Hat. And we've been pretty effective with uh, media and, and press. And in general, I think 
that local media and regional media is really effective because you can reach thousands and thousands of people and it's free. And so you don't need money if you can get it on your regional television and if you can get it in the newspaper, you, you reach a whole lot of people and it doesn't cost anything. But how do you get that money to keep some of those things going? To support the community organizing activities? Well, actually, um, the bulk of the funding that we use is comes from fee-for-service activities. Um, we sell services to state and local government. I also do consulting and things like that that brings in discretionary money that doesn't have any strings attached, that doesn't have restrictions like state and federal grants and funding streams. And then you can use that money to lobby, to do media work, to buy gasoline, to um, also, you know, give money to other people to come in and do that. And that's been a real big key is finding things. And I guess maybe it's just a cultural thing, but I always figured, you know, to get money, you've really only got two ways is either you work for it or you commit crimes and just haven't been that comfortable committing crimes. So I figure you got to work for it. And that's figuring out the Tom Sawyer effect is figuring out things that people need or that they will pay for and then they give you money and with no strings I can give money to people from around the state whether they're in my CIL area or not or even from my state or not and fund a lot of things an example is because we have discretionary money we were able to um, purchase a great big lift equipped over the road bus and we went on that rolling freedom tour all around um, 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 the, uh, was that the Olmstead decision, I believe, um, that came out, and we went all over the country, and this lift equipped bus that had signs on it, and so on, and that took discretionary money to do, um, but in fact, it was able to affect the country and able to support people to participate from all over the country, not from Kansas, from Georgia, Alabama, and so on. So, Mike. In terms of learning, uh, we all learn from our mistakes. Can you give us some examples of what you learned in terms of some of the mistakes you've made in this whole area? And then also talk a bit about how you prevent or cope with burnout. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I, I, maybe I'll start backwards here. Um, Burnout, it, it's, it's very real and, and a very serious kind of thing. And so one way is pace. You have to understand that a lot of larger issues will take a long time. Mikasa, we've been working on that over 12 years now. And you get real fired up, you get the anger, you get that going on, and you have to, if you're not careful, you'll just eat yourself up and burn up, and this is no good and you go away. So you have to understand things take time and there's a certain pace to it. And to a certain extent, take it easy on yourself. Sometimes it's hard to know when that's going on and then that's when your, your friends and your peers will kind of maybe help you out. You're getting a little off the wall here and um, you know, maybe relax. It looks like you're awful tired. You know, I know that you're hurting real bad and so on, just physical pain and, you know, let's relax. And so you have to rely on your friends and peers to help you and trust their judgment. Um, and, and just knowing that and sometimes shift gears. I look at, in terms of organizing, as sort of like um, concentric circles. And the smallest circle is the hardcore, busy all the time kind of circle around that circle, and that's a small, sometimes a smaller group, around that circle is, is another group of folks that are very committed and active, but it's not like the major, you know, hard driving piece, but they're going to be active, they're going to come to meetings, they're going to come to a demonstration, they're going to write the letter, help make the sign, and so on. And there's a third circle around that that's sort of like the supporter circle is folks that are behind you and they're with you, but for whatever reasons aren't going to be real active. A little uncomfortable, they want to learn more, increase their knowledge base, and things like that. And then what you have to be able to do and be okay with is that you drift back and forth between those circles. And, and that it is okay to do that. And you don't have to be 24-hour hardcore if you're not willing to 
be arrested every day for the rest of your life and you're not good enough or something. You have to be okay with moving back and forth out of those circles um, so you can rest up and then let other folks take turns doing other different things. And that's what I found works really well. In terms of an example of a major mistake that was way too much anger and not enough sense was, uh, there was one time that I was in the state house and we had some attacks on our state act against discrimination, which we had developed to mirror the ADA amongst other things. And we had a major tussle going on with the State Chamber of Commerce and the League of Municipalities. And there was this dang whippersnapper <laughs> in the state house that turned around to me and started lecturing me about what this law meant and what its history was when I helped develop it and write it and I just lost it. And I literally, in front of everybody, legislators, backed this guy in the corner, got right in his face and was just letting him have it. I was being very threatening, you know, on the verge of violent. And that was way too far and I really lost it and I really felt bad about it. You know, I mean, some of my friends thought it was rather amusing, but I felt horrible. And that was a big mistake because I lost some credibility. But that was too far. Um, you don't push that hard. And you have to be able to control yourself enough, at least in public, even with your worst enemy, to keep a certain level of, of, of decent comportment. Because it was a legislative issue and it was the wrong attitude in the wrong place. And I'll never lose it like that again demonstrations, talking to the media, getting involved publicly, even to the point of being arrested, especially if the cameras aren't, all sort of the sexy things about the advocacy issues. But what about the follow-up? Speak to the importance of the follow-up after the, the party's over, so to speak. Well, that's paramount. You, you've actually hit the nail on the head. Demonstrations, being arrested, and all that stuff are not the end. They're a means to an end. And the follow-up is what you want. You engage in letter writing, meetings, demonstrations, media events, even arrests to get to the table. And that goes back to knowing why you're doing this, having your goals clear, so when you get to the table, then you're ready to work. And all those are means to an end, and that's just a matter of knowing clearly what your goals are and making sure that what you're doing is, is there's buy-in in your group and shared within your group so you're clear about what to discuss. All the work happens, well not all of it, but a ton of it happens after you're at the table. And that's when you're drafting language, that's when you're reaching agreements around funding, and that's the down and dirty stuff. And those are the hours long meetings, day after day, month after month. Those are the lonely times when you're in the committee hearings or up at the, up at the Capitol and it's midnight, it's one in the morning, it's 10 o'clock where all that work kinds of, kind of happens. The sexy stuff is just a way to get there. Can you, um, if you were to think about your accomplishments and your career and where you're going, what do you, th what, what do you hope your legacy will be? I really hope that a major piece of my legacy will be that there are honest, independent living, home and community options and services as opposed to institutions. And I hope my legacy is that the last institution closes before I die. And that's probably the major thing that I really want to see happen. Okay, that's really great. Mike, can you think in terms of all your experience, all your marches, all your demonstrations, all your campaigns, Tell us about some memorable sound bites, posters, chants that really stick in your mind. Let's see. Well, one of the most memorable kind of posters was some theater stuff that I think Diane Coleman and some others did when she was in Tennessee. And it was this giant, and it was a state issue, I think, and they made this giant cardboard dinosaur but it was something Osaurus with the guy's name, and they'd made up all this fake money, and they had this dinosaur eating up all this money and doing things. And I'm not saying it really well, but it was really cool, and there was only like three or four of them, and they got all this media and all this attention with this really great giant cardboard cutout 
and the money. And that was just, I always remember that, of being a really cool, effective thing with a very small number of people that really hit the, the nail on the head. Um, what was your favorite T-shirt? My favorite T-shirt? Oh, well, my favorite T-shirt is years ago, back in Kansas, we were closing a state hospital. And uh, I think June remembers this. And we made up these t-shirts uh, when Mike Donnelly was the director of the center where I'm at now. And they had this picture of uh, Dorothy in a hospital bed with the rails. And you could see like this stone wall with bars on the window. This is what this place was like, an old Gothic horror institution. And you could see the stone walls and the bars on the window. And you could see Toto on Dorothy's hospital bed. And, she, and the caption is, Toto, I don't think we're at home. And it was really cool. And boy, did we ever get killed for that. Oh, man, we made so many people mad. We got thousands of pieces of hate mail. It was intense. But I still have that t-shirt. I love it. I don't even wear it that much because I, I want to keep it because it is so cool. And the graphics are very nice. I mean, it really looks good. And I guess my other thing in terms of an event or a statement or something was when we had the hearing on the first Mikasa, and we got Newt Gingrich to come into a room literally arm in arm with Dick Gephardt saying the same thing about the same piece of legislation, and that was Mikasa. And I don't think that there's any other issue or group that ever got those two to agree on anything or be in the same room together. And in that hearing was really memor memorable in terms of what got said in there and just how it was set up the liberal Democrat and the arch conservative of the new states' rights kind of era marching in and all talking about freedom and liberty. And it was a very big thing in that hearing. Do you have any advice for, uh, for infant living centers who are wanting to get involved in, in organizing activities but haven't quite taken the leap, the steps? Well, I would say, first of all, that to really be effective, you have to figure out a way to get your own money. If you're totally beholding to your funding from any one source or any governmental source, there will come a time when they turn off the tap or threaten it, and it's very real. And financial independence is key to being effective ongoing um, is one thing. And the other thing for centers that I think get left out is you have to have your board buy-in. You have to have your board buy-in. You can have the strongest director and the most active and aggressive staff, and if the board hasn't bought in to advocacy and to different tactics, then it won't happen right or it won't, it won't ever really get started. And I think a lot of times with CILs, we forget that our boards are in charge and they also control some purse strings and we have to have their buy-in and having a knowledgeable, activist, advocacy-minded board is just as important as having a staff or a director that's that way. And those are probably the two things. Anything else you want to add? Anything we may not have asked that you think are some important points that you want to make? Well, I would just say that um, to be good citizens, we owe it to everybody and ourselves to be active and be a part of our government and a part of our communities. And that does not just always mean going along and listening to what the talking head says. We, uh, I think we have an obligation to find out things, to look into issues, to seek out alternative sources of news and information, and to be a part of our communities in our local and state government. I think a lot of times people forget about local government. And there are county commissions and city councils where you can get a lot done, and it's very close to you. Up here in Washington, it's hard to see senators. You don't get to go to hearings and things like that. But you can go to a city council or a county council meeting, and no one will be there. And you can go up to a microphone and say whatever you want and get a lot done. So remember, too, be very local and use these local governments and county councils and school boards and um, the landfall, uh, the, I'm sorry, the landfill maybe board, even the water board are places of political power, are places that where the public can have input and you can get a lot done. Uh, and it's not just always the president or what happens in Washington. You can get a ton done looking at local government and local political 
entities.